Good evening, virtual audience. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Marisa LaFleur, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this event tonight with Kristen Harmel and Jennifer Rosner presenting their novels, The Book of Lost Names and The Yellow Bird Sings, respectively. Thank you again for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like this one, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community far and wide. Every week we'll be hosting events right here on our Zoom account, including next Friday's talk by Linda Rui Fang, discussing her novel, Swimming Back to Trout River. And that'll be part of our new, our new Voices in Fiction series. As always, our full event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can sign up for our, our email newsletter and also browse our bookshelves from your home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many of those as time allows. Also in the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase the Book of Lost Names and The Yellow Bird Sings on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of the series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings the, this last year or so, uh, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly and we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Kristen Harmel is the best selling author of more than a dozen novels, as well as the co-founder and co-host of the popular web series, Friends and Fiction. Her books include the upcoming book, The Forest of Vanishing Stars, as well as international bestsellers, The Winemaker's Wife, The Sweetness of Forgiving, and of course, tonight's featured book, The Book of Lost Names, which is inspired by a true story from World War II about a woman who used her forgery skills to help Jewish children flee the Nazis. The Tampa Bay Times calls it a thrilling story, adding Harmel weaves her extensive research into the story gracefully, and she keeps her engaging characters at the center. Jennifer Rosner is an author and professor of philosophy who has taught at Stanford and Mount Holyoke College before her current role teaching the Bard sponsored Clemented course in the humanities at the Care Center in Holyoke, Mass. She previously published the memoir, If a Tree Falls, and her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Massachusetts Review, the Forward and elsewhere. Her debut novel, The Yellow Bird Sings, follows a mother and daughter taking shelter from Nazi soldiers in a neighbor's barn. The New York Times describes The Yellow Bird Sings as an absolutely beautiful and necessary novel, full of heartbreak, but also hope about the bond between mother and daughter and the sacrifices made for love. We're so happy to have them both here with us tonight. Without further ado, I will turn the digital, digital podium over to Kristen. Thank you so much, Marisa, and thank you so much to all of you out there who are joining us tonight. Um, I'm so excited. It was actually Jennifer who invited me to do an event with her, and um, I'm just so impressed by her writing, and I'm so excited. Um, you know, I, I could have just maybe just done a Zoom myself with Jennifer to pick her brain and talk to her about this beautiful work she's doing, but I'm glad that we're doing it with a group of friends out there. This is going to be so much fun. Um, as Marisa said, if you have questions for us, just plug them into the Q&A. Um, and I also did want to say, you know, it's really difficult to write a debut novel um, because I think that part of becoming a novelist is learning and getting better as you go. But right out of the gate, Jennifer has just swept us away with this novel that the New York Times called, as Marisa said, she read that beautiful quote, but they also called it exquisite and heartrending, which I, you know, I can't think of a better way to describe it. And, and what, a, what a beautiful review, what beautiful praise, but this book deserves it so much. Um, and we are so lucky that the book is now out in paperback. So it's at that nice, you know, lower price point. And um, as Marisa said, if, um, if after our talk tonight, you feel inclined um, to buy it, I hope you'll consider buying it from Harvard Bookstore because they do, you know, it, these bookstores um, go out of their way to provide these wonderful platforms for us to chat. So um, we're grateful to you that you're here. Um, we hope you consider supporting Harvard Bookstore. And Jennifer, can you begin by telling us about your beautiful book, The Yellow Bird Sings? 
Thank you, Kristen. I'm so, so excited to be here with you today. And um, I just love your book so much. So I feel like we're so lucky to be able to have this conversation. And I really want to thank the Harvard Bookstore for having us too. Um, it's kind of a dream venue. And <laughs> I really um, am grateful to be here. Um, so The Yellowbird Sings um, is about a mother and daughter um, a five-year-old daughter who are hiding in a, for their lives in a farmer's barn in Poland during World War II. And the girl, Shira, is a musical prodigy. So she feels music pulsing through her and she taps on her mother's leg and hums. But in this barn, she has to be completely silent. She conjures a bird who can sing out the music she hears in her head and in other ways enact a childhood she can't have. And her mom, in an effort to pass you know the minutes and then hours and then days in the barn um, whispers a story about a brave little girl and her bird who avert threats and find safety um, but of course there are very real threats in this barn the farmer's children are trying to get into the barn there are neighbors who would denounce a jew for a bag of sugar um, there are soldiers walking by to the tavern etc and the as the dangers mount the mom has to make this impossible choice about whether to find a new hiding spot together with her child or to make a decision to put her child in a safe spot alone and that's kind of the way that novel begins um so we are each gonna kind of just say that short type brief thing about our novel and then read a section. So I'll read a section now and then we'll get to hear Kristen speaking about her beautiful book, um, The Book of Lost Names. So this is from The Yellowbird Sings. It's just very early on in the novel and it's from the daughter's point of view. It shifts in the book from the mother and daughter's point of view. So this is from Shira. Shira practices being invisible. She hunches her shoulders sucks in her stomach, slinks like a cat. Her mother practices too, burying herself deep in the hay and beckoning Shira with a wave of her hand to settle into her lap and be still. Or with a finger to her lips, she instructs her to stay silent. The floorboards are rough and the hay is sharp and scratchy. Shira does not understand why they can't go home, why they ever left home, where together her mother and father tucked her into bed as if in a soft downy nest and where music and the scent of her grandmother's baking wafted through the air. There, Shira could patter down the hall and join the company, watching as they unclasped the cases of their instruments. Nestled in her grandfather's lap, breathing in the workshop smells of sawdust and lacquer, she bounced and tapped to the ripple of notes from her mama's cello, her tata's violin. At first in the tuning and warm up, Everything sounded off kilter and sad, but then they struck up their songs and the music carried them all until Shira no longer felt herself settled against her grandfather, but in an altogether different place of pure shared beauty. Vibrant, soulful melodies, fiery stomping rhythms. It didn't matter how loud things got. There wasn't a neighbor in the building who didn't relish their playing. Shira could even hum if she wanted to. But here, her mother is insistent. They need to be silent, to hide. So she coils herself tight like a spring and holds herself in. Shira strives to mute the sound of every movement, her footfalls, her breath. The anticipated stream of her pee, she has learned to meet out in a near silent trickle. And she knows to cover over and so erase any sign of her existence, a series of vanishing moments before she retreats beneath piles of hay. Yet even as Shira wills herself to silence, her body defies her with a sudden sneeze, an involuntary swallow, the loud crack of her hip from being still too long. A calf muscle cramps, an itch needs a scratch, her bowels press. The most carefully planned movement causes the hay to rustle or a floorboard to whine. Shira looks over at her mother apologetically worried her mother stares back shira settles into the hay and tries again to be still until notes snippets of song and soon whole passages take shape and pulse through her quiet at first then building in intensity and growing louder a story told with strings and woodwinds a glacial night a flickering fire sounds like black water beneath br bright ice faces and timpani and a violin's yearnings and finally a crescendo, the frozen earth cracking. 
Her mother waves an arm, her forehead furrowed. Shira realizes she is tapping again. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> So we want to hear from Kristen about is what um, the Book of Lost Names is and um, and hear a passage. Uh, Jennifer, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much for reading that. You're you're such, just such a beautiful writer, and that was um, so powerful and just so sad. I mean, I, I think with the writing you and I do, we're we're um, you know we we can't escape thinking about um, the the psychological and just human impact of that time period, but to think about it affecting a child and, and just that, that need to stay silent. It's uh, that's just it, very powerful, but beautiful, Jennifer. I can't wait to talk to you about it. So the Book of Lost Names, which actually comes out in paperback on Tuesday, I'm so excited, um, is the story of a female forger in World War II, I just dropped the book, who <laughs> stumbles into the French resistance mostly by accident, and she winds up helping save the lives of hundreds of children. So she and her mom are fleeing the Nazis themselves, and they wind up in this small French mountain town in the unoccupied zone, where a priest wor working for the local resistance network there um, finds out about her false papers and approaches her to ask her if she would be willing to help him with some forgeries in exchange for helping it for, in exchange for him giving her some assistance in getting her um, her father out of the detention center where he's being held just outside of Paris. So she agrees initially thinking, you know, this is a way to help my dad. This is a way to get my dad out. Um, but soon she meets Remy, who's a forger who's been working in the network for a little bit longer. Um, and he kind of grudgingly takes her on as an assistant and then realizes that she is actually better at this than he is. She just kind of has a natural instinct for it and a natural talent. They're primarily um, forging documents for children. Um, so as this goes on, she becomes passionate not just about saving these children, but also about preserving their identities, especially those who are too young to remember who they really are once their names have been changed. And I know, Jennifer, that's something you and I can talk about later because that's something our books have in common. Um, but in my book, they decide to encode those identities in a nondescript 1732 religious text that they refer to as the Book of Lost Names, hence the title of the novel. Uh, but toward the end of the war, the book goes missing, possibly looted by the Nazis. Um, and this is right around the time that their resistance cell is blown and Remy goes missing too. So Remy's gone, there are no answers, um, and kind of all these secrets go missing with the book. And then we pick up 60 years later with Ava, it's now 2005, um, she's a librarian in Florida, which is where I live, and she sees in the New York Times uh, a picture of the Book of Lost Names in a an article about Nazi looted books and the search to return them to their rightful owners. So as we see her story developing in the past, we also see her in the present kind of trying to summon the courage to go back to Berlin or to go to Berlin to see if she can possibly reunite with this book, if it is indeed her book, um, and find the answers to these secrets that have been sort of eluding her for all these years. So that's the Book of Lost Names, and I will read a very short passage from the beginning. It actually begins in 2005. Um, so this is the viewpoint of older Ava. She's a librarian, she's working in Florida, um, and it's just kind of a good little quick introduction to the book. So it's a Saturday morning, and I'm midway through my shift at the Winter Park Public Library when I see it. The book I last laid eyes on more than six decades ago. The book I believed had vanished forever. The book that meant everything to me. It's staring out at me from a photograph in the New York Times, which someone has left open on the returns desk. The world goes silent as I reach for the newspaper, my hand trembling nearly as much as it did the last time I held the book. It can't be, I whisper. I gaze at the picture. A man in his 70s looks back at me, his snowy hair sparse and wispy, his eyes frog-like behind bulbous glasses. 60 years after end of World War II, German librarian seeks to reunite looted books with rightful owners, declares the headline. And I wanna cry out to the man in the image that I am the rightful owner of the book he's holding the faded leather bound volume with the peeling bottom right corner and the gilded spine. It belongs to me and to Remy, a man who died long ago, a man I vowed after the war to think of no more. But he's been in my thoughts this week anyhow, despite my best efforts. Tomorrow, the 8th of May, 
the world will celebrate the 60th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day. It's impossible, with all the young newscasters speaking solemnly of the war, as if they could conceivably understand it, not to think of Remy, not to think of the time we spent together then, not to think of the people we saved and the way it all ended. Though my son tells me I'm blessed to have such a sharp mind in my old age, like many blessings, this one is mixed. Most days, I just long to forget. So that's just kind of like a little taste of the, the present day portion of the novel. Yeah, it's so, so moving. And I, I loved how you read it. And it just makes you want to <laughs> find out. Yeah. I felt like that about yours, too. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and so, Jennifer, of course, both books came out in hardcover last year. And we were both actually finalists for Nas the National Jewish Book Award, um, which was such an honor. And as we mentioned earlier, they're both out now in paperback, which kind of gives... Um, it's kind of fun when you start in hardcover and then move to paperback because I kind of feel like it gives the book sort of a whole new chance to find a new audience. So, I, you know, I hope that some of the people listening out there tonight who have not read your book or who have not my, read my book might consider them in that new format. And of course, again, from Harvard Bookstore. Um, so, Jennifer, I would love to dig in first with where this idea came from. Can you tell us about where the inspiration for The Yellow Bird Sings came from? Yeah, so, and it's always interesting, I think, uh, to hear about this stuff. I mean, I was a philosophy grad student, and um, I had just finished, and I we had our first daughter who was born deaf, and that was really quite a, a surprise, actually. And um, I ended up having never done any kind of creative writing. I just thought I better journal about like all that was happening in our lives, and I, you know, about our decision making and and wondering sort of how we were going to handle the deafness. And and then in the end, my second daughter also was born deaf, and it turns out we have these recessive genes <laughs> for deafness, and. I had put together um, these snippets of a journal and then learning in my ancestry of these great, great aunts who were also deaf. And I thought I was writing, you know, sort of a memoir that had to do with, um, you know, our, our children and then these great, great aunts, two sets of deaf sisters. And I actually was on tour with this book. It became this memoir called If a Tree Falls. Uh, and um, I was on a book tour and I was talking about the decision we made for our children to get them access to sound with technology and we were doing listening and spoken language and so we were really happy if they were squealing or screaming or making any sound at all. And um, I was talking about this, the thrill of their vocalization when a woman in the audience actually described her experience of having to be completely silent. She was hidden in a shoemaker's attic with her mom during World War II. And I think it was the juxtaposition of like how much we were try trying to get our children to make sound and then thinking about this woman who had to be silenced and then her mother who had to keep her silent and what that must have been like. Yeah. And it was that kind of the silencing and the hiddenness and all these yeah. things that were reverberating so deeply for me at that time. That was really what started it. And I ended up interviewing her and from her, I ended up interviewing many, many hidden children. Um, so, so it is somewhat random, right? <laughs> I was there working on a book that had nothing to do with this and then I and then there I was on a left turn in this way but um that's awesome Wait, was she was she Polish was she from Poland um you know actually I think she was from Austria the woman okay. I first met and um but but yeah there I met so many different hidden children as a result of being in touch with her um and so many they just had so many different kinds of stories and they were they were all different but then they also shared all this ingenuity and persistence and kind of the ability to appreciate beauty I mean there were all these certain things that kind of kept shining through in, in interview after interview it was very very inspiring and what a beautiful yeah. opportunity to be I mean to be able to talk to to these survivors who could tell you their stories firsthand. Yeah, what it was an honor. It, it really was. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Um, what made you wind up setting the book in Poland? Um, I mean, I think that I have a grandma who was from Poland and um, there was just so much happened in Poland, you know, in terms of the, in terms of hidden children in different environments, in Polish homes, in convents, etc. cetera. Um, and, I just thought it made the most sense really for my characters. Yeah. No, what about you? Can you tell us the inspiration for yours, for the Book sure. of Lost Names? Sure, yeah, so for the Book of Lost Names, yeah. And it, I'm just, I was curious about Poland because I, you know, 
well, I know we'll talk about this later, but my first book set in Poland comes out this summer. I always write about France. So that was quite a departure for me. So it, it was kind of the same thing, though. There are so many stories that happen there and so much real life inspiration. And I also had to share with you, Jennifer, that my 2014 book is about um, a deaf child. So that's uh, oh. we have that in, in common, too, which yeah. is kind of funny. Um, but uh, yeah, so the Book of Lost Names. Um, is about forgers, as I as I mentioned, a forgers for the French Resistance, and it was while writing my 2019 book, The Winemaker's Wife, and my 2018 book, The Room on Rue Amelie, which both involve the French Resistance, and which both involve people moving on their way using forged documents, that I began to think to myself, okay, well, I know everyone has these forged documents that they're moving around with, but where did they come from? Who was forging them? Like, and then beyond that. How do you get into forgery? What kind of background do these people have? What were the risks? Was this something that was very dangerous? Was this something you know you could easily do? Like how you know what were the challenges? And the more questions I had, the more I thought, okay, I, I think this might be the basis for a novel. So when I finished writing *The Winemaker's Wife*, I just really dug into the research because you know, as you know, Jennifer, there has to be enough there to write about, right? Like it, it, you've got to be able to kind of wrap your head around the concept before you can start kind of crafting those characters and crafting the storyline. And, and you have to know you can do it in a way that um, does the real story justice or, or, that, or that does the world justice and, and you, you know, write it with accuracy. Um, so I, there was in fact enough written. Um, uh, and, but I didn't quite have the story until my literary agent sent me an article from the New York Times about Nazi looted books and the search to return them to their rightful owners. And the second I read that, I was like, yes, like that is the story that wraps around the story. And there has to be a book at the heart of this. Cause you know, books can give us so much more than just the stories printed on their pages. Books carry, you know, traditions and secrets and, and experiences. And we all interact with, you know, the same book in a different way. So like that, that concept was really important to me too. Um, so to be able to do both of those together in a novel was, was really cool. Um, yeah. But, and so much emotionality. I mean, that's yeah. what I feel is really present in, in your beautiful writing. And, um, and I was You're thinking scared. about how, um, you know, when I read it, when I read it, I was, the, there were so much, the, there were these details about the different types of paper and the different kinds of stamps and the different kinds of, um, like you had to make, there were so many details and everything had to be seeming authentic, right? It was yeah. really complicated <laughs> and it was very, I, I loved that I got a sense of the complexity of it. Oh, well, thank you yeah. for saying that. Yeah, I felt like that about yours too. Um, and so, you know, about yours, I wanted to ask, first of all, what made you decide um, to make the child of a, a violinist, right? Like I, I'm so interested in that, like why specifically that interest or, or, or the, that, I'm sorry, that instrument. But beyond that, why music? I mean, you did it so beautifully, even in that passage you just read, you know, I, I could I could feel the music coming through, but I mean, that's, you know, an, an iota of what you experience in the actual book. Like the actual book, you can just I mean, you can always hear the music. It's amazing. You do it so well. So can you talk about A, why she's a violinist, but but B, just why music in general? Yeah, thank you. Um, so a few things. When I was in the research for my memoir and I found these great, great aunts, they actually lived, you know, in a little shtetl um, deaf and they, I learned this one detail, which is that they tied a string from their wrist to their babies at night so that when the baby cried, they would feel a tug on their oh. wrist and wake to care for them. Wow. And it was like this string in the night. It was like this connection, a mothering, yeah. a way of listening, a way of mothering. Yeah. And it was really emotional for me because there were two things. I mean, one was I felt worried about whether I'd have a connection to my daughters because we had this sensory difference which is somewhat profound and i didn't know if we would like sort of be able to cross that distance and then also i think i had felt that there were deafnesses in my childhood that i wasn't positive i had a string from my mom to me and i wanted more than anything to have this string between me and my girls and um i think the violin is that it's like strings in the dark it's like shira calling to her mother it's this way of her connecting so for me it's like a sort of symbolic and then the other thing is that my dad played violin every day every single day of my life and wow. um he actually died right before the novel um got published and um oh, so but he thank you but he showed me really like the 
con connective power of music and kind of the transportive power. And yeah. um, I could see him sort of connecting even with his Jewish roots when he would compose music, et cetera. So I knew, I just knew that music could play this kind of role and yes. I wanted it to play this role in, in the novel. And um, so that's, that's basically why music. I I, I love that. You know, I um I always think of music as as a um as another language. I I mean it, it really is. And it's one that I think some people are just born as Shira was, um, being able to speak, you know, for lack of a better word, from from the very start. I mean, that's not a talent that I have. I, I used to pretend I had that talent. I played the <laughs> drums in my high school band, like I thought I had that talent. But no, like I think some people just feel it in their bones and and in their soul. And and you just um you portrayed that so beautifully in the novel. H how did you do that? Are you a musician also? I mean, just the, the I, mean, I know you mentioned your dad, but um, just the way that you speak about music on the page um, seems to come mm -hmm. from a very authentic, beautiful place. Thank you. Well, I mean, I trained, I trained vocally with an, I sang opera actually, which is wow. a little um, unusual, really. <laughs> Um, oh but I, you, yeah, I trained you and, you and Kate Quinn need to have like a I know. Dancing opera yeah. Too, the <laughs> Kate Quinn. yeah, like yeah. the two of you need to go on the road together. And, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I trained as an opera singer, but I also like to sing all kinds of music. And, um, and that was one of those things where when I did, I did sometimes feel my mom couldn't hear, but whenever I sang, she just stopped and listened. And that was also part of it where I knew that music could really connect people. And, um, but really the way i worked through the music in this novel had to do with being the, it was the generous consultations of you know a master class violinist and a musicologist so this master class violinist um you know he and i spoke about how do you get a project prodigy up and running like what would she learn what order how would she be practicing what would she play i mean etc et like all the details of musical prodigy yeah. which are so different than just musical you know a, a violin player you know like oh, sure. a prodigy and um and also a music historian and I, we spoke, he helped me list, learn how to listen to the stories beneath the music, which is such a skill, you know, it's not something we really, you can't just sort of do that necessarily. I mean, there might be some intuition, but he really helped me like learn how to listen. So um, yeah, and, and I think it relates actually to sort of what we learn in our research and, and how it, how, you know, and, and how it guides us in our work. So I am really curious to hear about your research pathway and, and all the things, because I know you had these artifacts you were working with. And... I did. Yeah, it's funny. I, I do so many of these Zooms are just like sitting right here. Yeah, so exactly. Like, artifacts. I'm like, boom, I got them. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you mentioned earlier um, the the details of the forgeries, right? And that was something that even with all the reading I did, even with, you know, um, survivor interviews I listened to, th things like that, I, I felt like I wasn't quite wrapping my head around it. So there's a lot of mention of different types of paper. And I, I was like, okay, I acknowledge that there are different types, but like, what were the types, you know? Um, it, it, or, you know, they talk about a stamp and how difficult it was to forge a particular stamp. And it's like, okay, but like, why? Like, why was this stamp more, you know, it, like those were the things yeah. I just couldn't quite hone in on the details. But um, then I found this, or I was able to get my hands on this, which was a, um, a Nazi issued travel document issued in December of 1940 in Paris, which this was such a neat thing to have for a number of reasons. So this would have been something very, very common for forgers to forge because you couldn't travel around France without one. You couldn't just hop on a train and hope somebody would leave you alone. You had to have this saying why you were going from point A to point B and that yes, indeed, you had the Germans permission to do so. Um, but you can see the, like the heraldic eagle stamp um, you know, you can see sort of the seal on top, you can see sort of all this official documentation, which was, I think, more difficult um, than it looks on the surface. But being able to actually have this and hold it um, helped me, I think, to kind of connect the dots of everything I'd read about in terms of how to do forgery and what made it a challenge. But more than that, it kind of gave me this connection to the past. I mean, somebody used this to travel in or out of, or, you know, out of Paris in December of 1940. So, you know, I, I don't know that it was a forged document. I think it was probably a, a real document, but it was a document that was in someone's hands during that Nazi occupation. So that was really interesting. Um, I had a couple other things like that. I had um, some copies of the Journal Officiel, which was a, uh, the government 
uh, newspaper, like the government record at the time, which is where a lot of forgers took um, false names from so that they matched up to official records. Um, and I also had uh, a, a baptismal certificate from, I think it was 1942. It's over in my desk. I always think I should pull it out before these things, but it's like sitting in my desk drawer. And if I went for it, like you'd just see me like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing about Zooms, right? Like we never match on the bottom half what we're wearing <laughs> and the top half. And you just, yeah, you don't want to see me in my life. You can't stand yeah. up. <laughs> I can't stand up. It would end, end poorly for all of us. Um, no, um, so it, it's a, it's a uh, baptismal certificate because a lot of children who were being hidden um, or moved on to another destination needed to prove um, that they were Christian as opposed to Jewish. And that was the best way to do it, to say, well, of course, here is her baptismal certificate. She was baptized, you know, in this particular Catholic church in 1940 or whatever. And, and so that was something that forgers forged too. Another really cool thing I had, um, I mentioned when I was talking about the book, the book within the book called the Book of Lost Names, which was just a nondescript 1732 religious text. It was a guide to the weekly masses. And that is the book that they put their code within, or they put, you know, they, they did all their coding within that book. So I actually have the real um, Book of Lost Names, which is not, it's not really have a code in it. The code within the novel is fictional. Um, this is from 1732. It's a French religious text. And I always say, hang on, I am going to do a, a dive from the book, but um, <laughs> I do think it's cool because the cover designer never saw this book. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard to tell here, but this used to have gilding on the front like this one did. So it would have looked very similar to that. But what I really think is cool is that the spine really nails it. Like the spine looks very, very oh. similar. Um, and she she did that without ever having seen this, which I, I think is neat. It always made me kind of feel like, you know, I don't know, like it was meant to meant to be in some in some way. I'm always looking for those silly little signs. <laughs> but but yeah, so that that's some of my that's some of my research stuff. Um, so you talked about the music, and I'm so interested in that. Um, I'm also interested, though, like in your personal background. So you said you were, you, or I think Marisa said, you have a PhD in philosophy. Is that it? Philosophy? How did. did that? How did that influence this book? I mean, I, I, I I'm just curious to hear what yeah. role that played because I mean, I you can sort of feel that in the pages. I, I love it. Um, I mean, I think it influences everything. It's it's um yeah, sure. It's it's a way of thinking, right? It's, it's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um one of the issues I think had to do with like the thread of identity and how that um kind of can come unraveled when especially yes. for instance, let when you lose your name and then you you know you're separated from your parents. I mean, in the case of my uh, my my daughter, my child <laughs> in, in the my character daughter of Shira, um she they're, they're, they're kind of our children, right? I mean you write <laughs> them and they in your it, head. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Shira, it, it, her name gets changed um, yes. when she's she's placed in an, in an, in a convent. She's her name is changed again later. Her name has changed three times, yeah. and she's very young, and and so she ends up not remembering her her given name. And unlike um, if she had had someone who had a book of lost names who was putting the you know the code in a book. Um, she just is told to forget that name and move on with this other one. And she's so young, she doesn't know what her parents' names are either. Nice. And um, and at the end of things, um, it's so, so hard. And I think that, you know, I think people forget because today, you know, anyone you want to find, you want to find your fourth grade friend, <laughs> yes. you'll find them on Facebook, you find it, you know, or Google, LinKedIn, something, you know, there'll be a way, you know. Sh Shira, and, Shira wasn't on Facebook. She didn't have a account <laughs> exactly, in no like 1940s Poland. <laughs> Yeah. And um, yeah, what she had is, you know, you'd get off at a yeah. station and there'd be like a, a fence with like a thousand pieces of paper yeah. fluttering, you know, off in the wind. And it was completely yeah. unsystematic. And, you know, I had thought, um, you know, there were sometimes like Irena Sendler had hidden um, yes. you know, children's names, um, the you know, the the given name and the assumed name on a piece of paper in a jar in a garden, buried in the garden. Yeah, but it's yeah. also very dangerous to have your name um, put together like that, because then, yes. you know, if it's found by the wrong people. So, you know, what was ingenious about the coding in the Book of Lost Names is that it was it was totally, you know, it was like a, um, you know, secret code to help you put back together the name. And you couldn't necessarily by looking at it, understand who's who. And I had also heard of stories of people who had hidden names, like in five different parts of names in five different notebooks. But then at some point, like, they're scattered and you know they're not yeah. together you can't put them back together etc but i think i was interested in identity and um in some sense names feel 
they feel topical. They feel kind of um, not so substantial in terms of like, what if you just started calling you Genevieve? Like, you know, it's not like you would be a different person, you know, but, but under certain circumstances, you know, especially yes. in developmental moments and when you can't hook back to a family or to your place. And in fact, I have something too that I've kind of carried around with me, which I got from the Holocaust wow. Museum in DC, which was this program called Remember Me. And it was these, you know, there'd be these children and they were, they would, you would get a photo and it said, do you remember me? And it was this literal question. Like, if you remembered me, wow. you would tell me my name, my village. I could maybe find out who I am and where I came from and find my family, et cetera. So it was really oh just gosh. so profound, you know, to have, to be such a child. So it's interesting that we were, what's, what I think is so cool is that there were some ways in which we were working on something conceptually very similar and we approached yes. it in really different ways. And then you have a new book coming out, The Forest of Vanishing Stars. And there's a character in my novel who is, you know, kind of trying to survive in, in this kind of primeval forest for quite a while. It's yes. freezing cold, digging the thing. And then you're working on um, some forest um, survivors, et cetera. Yes. So, so, you know, I should go on tour with you and Kate Quinn because yes, let's do <laughs> I'll, it. I'll be singing with her. I, 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 I love it. I love it. That's a great idea. Yeah, you guys can <laughs> sing and I'll just talk about my forest stuff. Okay. So, yeah, you, you, awesome. guys, you guys, I'll play the drums in the background. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> no, see, I think the message here, Jennifer, is you and I were just meant to be friends. That's, that's exactly. obviously, it, you know, we've been writing circles around each other for years, apparently, exactly. right? It's coming yeah. closer ever closer. Um, yeah, yeah I, so I'm interested in talking to you about that also. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about that in one second. I did want to remind everyone out there, uh, we have about five more minutes or so of conversation before we open it up to questions. Um, make sure to put them in the Q&A section. We would love to take your questions. So um, so if you have a question for us, please do put them right there in the Q&A. And it looks like there are some in there, which is great. I'm just looking right now. Fantastic. I see a great one from Anissa. She always, and Susie Baldwin, they both always have awesome questions. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the forest, um, I, I, so you and I were writing, I think about the same forest and we were influenced by some of the same, um, the same real life stories. And, and of course the, um, the probably most well-known one is the, the story of the Bielski Otriad, which were, um, led by, uh, these brothers with the surname Bielski, um, who, uh, who went into the woods initially just to sort of escape themselves and wound up, um, saving the lives of of around 1200 people in it, who basically they spent the war in the woods and survived that way. They set up a whole society, which you detail so beautifully in, um, in uh, the yellow bird sings. Can you talk a little bit about that? I would love to hear about your research and how you, um, you know, just knowing what I knew about the group. And I've actually talked to the youngest Bielski who's still alive, uh, Aaron Bielski. Yeah. Did you talk to him also? Um, I was in touch with him a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, well, I mean, my research, there I was in my, you know, what uh, in my window seat in Western Massachusetts, right? You know, con <laughs> con concocting a story, you know, that after steeping in, lis you know, listening and listening to these hidden children, but then setting them all aside because, you know, maybe they'll write their own story or maybe their children or grandchildren will. And so I was going to concoct my own story. And then after a while, you think, uh huh, but <laughs> maybe I better cross check. Yeah. 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 And so um, I um, I ended up getting in touch with a guide in Poland who was incredible. He read my manuscript in advance. He I, he took my eldest daughter came with me. We went to really the settings of my novel. He took me to this area of farmland where there were barns, you know, much like what I was describing. They they were you know they were just these incredible things. I I am not very good at share screen, but but um, at some point I <laughs> got to learn how to do that for the photos. I know me too. Me too. Yeah. Um, you know they were um, you know they were just these kind of um one thing about them is that you'd think maybe on farmland there'd be enough space that you could hide a person but in fact yeah. the, the the homes were very close together for community reasons and then the land like moved in these long swabs back so it would be very hard actually to be able to hide from your near neighbors and um and in fact when the guide took us on a somewhat unrelated field trip to just see his beautiful um, Orthodox church. When we got back to our place, some neighbor of ours on the trip, you know, as we were just visiting this little village said, why did you turn left rather than right? And I thought, wow, we are, we are being watched. Never yes, mind kind of funny <laughs> if my thought. characters yeah. were trying to hide Jews in their barn, you know, it would yes, be really hard. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you're not out doing anything you shouldn't be. Exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And he took us to an area of like a convent. He took us to a convent where Jewish children had been hidden. There was a partition where the yeah. person had been put. And 
what was interesting about that trip was, you know, I had imagined kind of a rather grand convent yes. <laughs> stone and corridors and whatever. And um, and then he said, you know, we're pretty poor in Poland. It's all brick. I had to really downscale my convent. Um, but but also I had these kind of, um, you know, sensory, so much sensory information, you know, like how your feet sound on the stone and what the smell of yes. mushrooms when we walked in and all the kinds of things. And these kind of incredible nuns who were taking us around and you could see the care. And um, it was just really amazing to be there. And then we went to this forest where uh, my daughter still won't let me over it. Like, she's like, really, Poland in winter? This is what we're doing? And she's like, why don't you set your book in Greece? Or why are aren't we in Italy? You know, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's why I read yeah. about Paris. It really is. I mean, <laughs> exactly. it, there's a benefit to it. <laughs> well, this is the thing about debut novels. Like I've learned, I've learned, you know, <laughs> now that my research took me to this freezing forest in Poland, I have to think about where I want to go next. Um, but uh, alas, the new thing is kind of in Poland too. Um, but, but not only Poland, but anyway, um, the forest was just so dense and, um, impossible like it would have been so hard to navigate i guess you know one thing that was so interesting was that the germans were pretty scared of going deep into the forest because oh, of the yes, partisans yes. right yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know it was very dangerous for them to be in the deep forest so they'd yeah. stay at the perimeter but um but to just be just the idea of being able to dig into this land i mean in the yeah. ice and whatever and get a burrow warm enough to stay protected and yeah. all the kind of details of living in the forest i ended up working with um a tracker who helped me like how do you how do you step if you bend if it's if it's summer and there's grass and the the bend shows from the sun that someone yeah. stepped there like there's all these signs of of how yeah. someone moves through the Woods and trying to learn how to move through either yes. the woods or the snow without leaving tracks and all those kind of things. And I think we also have in common mushroom forager research because <laughs> I also needed to do quite a lot. You know, she had to survive, but what was growing and when. Yes, exactly. And um, yeah, you should explain about how you landed on someone who knew this forest really well for your research for the. Yes. I mean, I could not have written this book without the help of his name was Vadim Sidorich, and he. Um, he is a Belarusian forest guide. So the, the area of the forest I was writing about was in Poland during the war, but is in Belarus now. So it's the same area, but just happens to be a different nationality than they would have been at that time. Um, but uh, yeah, he leads tours into the forest, but he's, he also has a PhD. Um, he's an expert in the, um, the uh, ecology of the area. He knew everything there was to know about the flora and fauna. And once he and I got working together, I mean, I would send him, 30, 40, 50 questions a day. And they were like little, I was saying to you earlier, Jennifer, they were minute things like what, what, you know, what were all the varieties of the mushrooms that would have grown in this particular part of the forest, uh, you know, in, in the middle of May or, you know, like they were very like finite. And he just, I don't think he blinked an eye. He was like, all right, well, it's these <laughs> mushrooms. And, you know, and he, here are the bugs that you could have eaten. And here's how you ice fish in the winter. And like, there were so many details. And, um, so you were, I, I'm so jealous that you were able to go there. I wrote this book during, um, during the year of, uh, of COVID. I mean, I, I had fully planned to go, um, but I sold it, I think in February of uh, 2020. Um, and my plan had been to go that summer to kind of round out the research. Um, and as we all know, I, you know, it was not probably no. possible to have flown to Belarus in the, you know, the middle of summer 2020. That was not happening. Um, but he really, he brought the forest alive for me. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, I, I would say, well, you know, okay, so they have this, um, you know, they're, they're, they're walking along and they have to find shelter and where would they find it? And he would trudge out into the woods himself and show me, like take pictures and say, this is a hollowed out tree trunk that if you slept this certain way, you could fit two people in it. Um, this was a World War I um, Russian bunker that was often used just for a night by, by, by refugees or partisans who were fleeing because it was, you know, it was a safe shelter, but you couldn't stay there for too long because the Germans knew where they were. So like there were all these little details that I never could have come upon on my own. So he kind of brought alive for me the flora and fauna and then talking to Aaron Bielski, the youngest Bielski brother, I kind of brought to me um, the, the human emotional aspect of it. Um, but I am looking I at like the clock. To, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go I do ahead, just want to say that it take it seems to take a village to raise a novel. That's what I've decided. It does. It's such a good point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I think what I'm getting here, though, is that everybody here needs to order um, the Yellow Bird Sings, the Book of Lost Names, and the Forest of Vanishing exactly. Star, because they're obviously all companion <laughs> books. They're linked. It's like it's like a series that we didn't even know we were writing, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. And, and then obviously then you need to go order um, if, if a tree falls, right? That, that's the name oh, of your okay. yeah. It, but but then also the life intended because those two are companion books. Yes, we did I'm, not going, know I'm going to be ordering that right away. <laughs> and I will oh. order yours as well. <laughs> so, oh. um, Marisa, would you like to come back on and, and uh, maybe guide us through a few of the questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that discussion. Um, we have a I lot feel of... like I could talk to Jennifer for hours. Can, can, can we just stay on until like 10 p.m.? Is everyone okay with that? <laughs> we'll see how many people stick with us. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we have a lot of wonderful compliments here in the q and I won't go through all of them, but um, people really love these books. Um, so the first question I have is for both authors, what was your favorite scene to write in your book and why? Ooh, that's a great question. J Jennifer, go ahead. I, I don't know the hmm. answer to that. <laughs> I, I know. Um, that's a great question. You know, probably for me, the ending of the novel was my favorite to write. Mm. Um, because there's this growing emotionality that, you know, just, and it feels synthesizing from so much that's happened before. And I just, I think that is probably if I, as a writer, my favorite place, of course, it's the, you know, it, it takes so long to get to that place because you're trying to figure out where you're going all for so, so long. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'd say probably the ending is my favorite, but I also just want to say that, I, I really love language. And so the writing yeah. process, even when these scenes are very hard, um, I feel like, um, you know, there's, it, it's funny, in some ways, it doesn't, to me, a mute it doesn't mute the emotional heart of it to focus sentence by sentence by sentence and like word by word and like read again for verbs read again for you know for everything so just descriptively the process of writing i think um actually can sometimes really support the emotional heart of your novel even though it sometimes feels like it would be a way of distancing i don't think it is actually it's like giving poetry to these difficult moments etc well, and, and you really do that in your book so well. I mean, the, the words do read like music. They're, they're just, it's, it's, yeah, it's just beautiful. Um, you know, for me, the, just the quick answer to that question is probably my last scene was my favorite to write also. I'm, I'm, I know I'm copying you, Jennifer. I'm like, oh, I don't have an answer. I'll just use your answer. But um, no, it, it, it really, the last scene um, kind of ties up some, uh, some loose ends and was an emotional one to write. So that was probably my favorite one too. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so... Um, Emily asks, uh, I don't know if both of these skilled writers are Jewish, but what from their backgrounds influences their story about World War II and children? Go ahead, Jennifer, you can take that one too, if you want. Yeah, um, yeah I am Jewish. I, um, it's funny, the, the notion of hiddenness and silence, et cetera, which were the main themes of my novel, and also the role of beauty in human survival, I feel like is sort of the a, a, like a very key thing. I feel like in some sense, this novel could have been set some and in, in some other time and place and that there are other cases of hiddenness and, um, you know, yeah. etc. But I think that honestly, when I chose my for Shira to be a violinist, it kind of it just kind of sealed it. It was yeah. a connection to um, Ju my Jewish past through my dad and and um, and and stuff like that. So I just felt this affinity and connection to the yeah. to the time. So that's how it how it happened. Yeah. And uh, and and for me, um, my uh, my dad's side of the family is Jewish, and I did not grow up with that. I grew up with my mom's side of the family, which was were Irish Catholic on that side. Um, and so a large part of my writing journey, but also my personal journey as an adult has been to explore this side of my family that, um, that, uh, that, that was something I never really knew about before. And that, and that didn't feel like a part of me because it wasn't handed to me, but it almost means more in a way because I've had to dig for it. So one of the interesting things, um, Jennifer, you'll get a kick out of this. I didn't know until I was writing, I was about halfway through writing The Forest of Vanishing Stars, the one that takes place in Poland, when my little brother sent me a link to our ancestry.com, you know, family tree. Um, my, the whole Harmel side of my family, the, the Jewish Harmels in my family had come from the exact area of Poland I was writing about. And I'd never known. I, I always thought that side of the family was from Austria and Germany, but the actual Harmels who came over carried that you know so it just it's kind of one of those things like i think um there's in a way these stories are are in our blood even if we don't know it um yeah. and, and i know yeah. emily emily also asked about children and i know um you and i are both mothers i, I have a five-year-old um 
and it's it's uh, it's painful to write about children who are separated from their parents. I, I think, um, and and children in peril because I think you can't help but put yourself and your own child in, into that situation a little bit. And, but, but maybe that deepens the emotion, you know, maybe that deepens yeah. the emotion as you're writing because, because it's so horrifically unimaginable, but it's something that so many people went through. Yeah. And I do think that like, I think I was writing about the longing of a child to be connected to her mother and the longing yeah. of a mother to be connected to her child. And yes. those are very personal themes. And, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's interesting because I've been working on a new novel that, um, has to do with some abductions post-war and wow. um, the ways in which, um, you know, people were deciding like where a child belonged, who it should be with, you know, and um, I think having raised deaf children and hearing from people like, well, if you're a hearing parent, why should you be raising your deaf child, that kind of thing. And so again, like it's, it's like impossible to avoid like what are these kind of core and personal things that are kind of circling your own life and it comes out in your work all the time. So I do think it's very, very personal, however fictional, you know, your work is. You were 100% right. And Jennifer, that is actually a thread that runs through the novel I'm working on right now, too. So obviously, you and I are going to have to take this show on the road. We're okay. just, just going to be tour buddies because we're just going to, awesome. obviously, we're writing the same stuff. So. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> Um, Meg says the book of lost names was her favorite book of 2020. Such oh, an incredible thank story. Thank you so um, much. And she directs this question to Kristen, but I think it would be interesting to hear both of your answers. What are you hoping readers will take away from your stories? Um, I, I, for me, um, it, it's funny on, on friends and fiction, the, which you mentioned in the introduction, which is the, um, it's an, it, for those of you who don't know, it's an online, um, group of, of readers and writers. And we have a Wednesday night, uh, Facebook live show. We had Jane Ann Krentz, the writer, on about a year ago. It's, it's been about a year now. And she said something um, during the show. She said, we all have one story to tell, and we just keep writing it different ways. I'm paraphrasing her badly. But at the time, I was like, that's not true. All my stories are so different. And then I thought about it, and I was like, nope. Like, I, you know, they are all very different stories, but I do keep writing the same story or the same general theme of um, we all have it within us to be extraordinary. So it's ordinary people rising up to become extraordinary, to do extraordinary things. But the idea that we can all do that in our own corners of the world, whatever's going on around us. If people could do it during World War II, during such dark times, um, you know, we can all we can all do it now. So I think that's kind of one of the takeaways that I hope you know people leave leave the book of lost names with. Yeah, I did. Um <laughs> 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 and, um, and I think, I think when I had alluded earlier to the idea that I think that like, there's this, the way creativity and beauty plays a role in human survival. I was so moved when I was talking to the hidden children I interviewed, for instance, you know, one of them was saying to me that, um, you know, that she like almost couldn't go on anymore at some point and then got like the vanilla scent of a tree bark, like breathed oh, wow. in and then was like, okay. And, you know, just this tiny little yeah. thing, but, but these things do sustain us in the most, you know, and, and art does, et cetera. And then there was this man who was hidden with his mom in a school attic and, um, he's, he, the situation was insane. Like he was inside the attic and there were children outside playing and he, you know, well, he was watching them through the slats and his mother had yes. found this atlas and she was helping him like learn geography and she was teaching him to read, et cetera. And he said to me that that time in the school attic was a time when he felt cocooned in love, which I thought was oh, wow, the beautiful. most unbelievable testament to this mom, to how she made this time, which was so dangerous and so it's terrifying, terrifying and, yeah. you know, incredible. So that's, I think, what I've been um, thinking about is, is that stuff. And I think it's about, for me, mother-daughter connections and just connectivity in general, and then yeah. this role of creativity and beauty. Yeah. What, what a beautiful message for this, for this year too. I mean, you know, we've, we've spent this whole last difficult year in a pandemic. We're not fully out of it. Like the times are still weird, but I love yeah. that cocooned in love and, and, and during the difficult mm -hmm. times. It's beautiful. It is. He's amazing. He's amazing. He's a Nobel Prize winning chemist now. And um, <laughs> wow. you know, he came out of that school attic and, you know, <gasps> and, you know, that, well, there's more, you know, there's just all this brilliance and genius that, you know, the survivors came with, but also so many were lost. And yeah. Wow. And, and to think that's a light somebody wanted to extinguish. I mean, I, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, sort of along those lines, another listener wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the relationships between the main characters and their mothers. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. We had talked about talking about that. We never got to it. So thank you to whoever asked. Um, Jennifer, do you want to go first? I think we write very, we, the, the mother daughter relationship is very different in, in both of our Yeah. Books. Yeah. I mean, in my story, the mother daughter relationship is very, very connected. Um, it's interesting because I had mentioned that, you know, I have had some complexities with my mom and and that's actually explored in my memoir too about whether i you know was heard and etc and um but but the mother daughter um relationship in in the yellow bird sings is this very close connection um but i also explore the the realities where there's this moment where you're you sort of wish your child wasn't right on you when something has happened and you need space or, or the child for a moment wonders would it be better somewhere else and i feel like you know i was really interested in creating a roundness to to those characters to their relationship and and generally because other things happen in the novel that are really rough and you know you, you know you wonder like how is a person both you know, abusive, but also bringing potatoes and also bringing socks and like, how does it all work? But I think that, you know, in our lives, like this is who we are, there's this roundedness where there's parts of us that, you know, are heroic, and there are parts that are not. And, um, you know, you saw it all the time when you started really d drilling down and seeing how people behaved in the war. Well, and I think it's it's writing those kind of relationships and those kind of well rounded characters that, that make books like this come alive, because you're right, it's, it's not just those one dimensional, you're the good guy, you're the bad guy. It led, right. you know let's do good things let's do bad things. you know what i mean like it's it's it, there's nuance to everything um I, I won't talk for too long about it but the mother-daughter relationship in the book of lost names um is is uh complicated i think partially because they're they're older and, and you know as i think we all know um sometimes as you get older you're you're you know it, the, the relationships you have with people who have been in your life your whole life sometimes can get more complicated partic particularly if you go um, separate directions or have different ideas about how your life should play out. And um, I, I, I will just say that even though there's a lot of conflict between Ava and her mother in this book, uh, to me, it's all rooted in love. Her mother really wants to protect her and she's just not doing it the right way, but she's doing it in a very human way. She's doing it in a way that just says, I don't want you to get hurt. So just, just stop, like just stand in place, stop trying to help people just save yourself. And so it, 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 there's a lot of anger laced in there, but it, it, to me, it all comes from a, pa a place of, of love. Yeah, it reads that way. It does. I mean, and I think that um, it's so true that like, w that is the impulse we might have with our child in a dangerous situation where you're just like, just please, you know, yeah. 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 And, and you're terrified. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm going to squeeze in two more questions. There's a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you, everyone, for being engaged. And I'm sorry we're not going to get to all of the questions. Um, but um, one person wants to know if you have any. My, Michelle wants to know if you have any tips for an aspiring historical fiction writer. Um, Do you want to take that first? Uh, sure. Um, research. To me, I mean, specifically with historical fiction, research, um, research, kind of. Uh, forms the backbone of it and then you build it out by creating dynamic characters um, and and putting them into um, a very real very well researched world so to me those are the two steps uh, the two major steps at the beginning a ton of research as much as you can immerse yourself in no details too small to bring the story alive um, but then it's, it's all about the characters and, and creating characters who will have interesting compelling realistic interactions in in this world that you've uh, put on the page how, how about you jennifer i agree with that and i also would say take your time because you know i think as we're starting i mean i'm you know it's my debut novel and it did take me a long time but I, and so i you know but i think that you know rushing rushing some especially when you're starting something like this yeah can it's 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 not fair you know you want to give it its due and take your time and i also think it just takes a lot of persistence like you know to just stick with it to keep going and show up every day as or as yes. much as you can to just keep showing up and i think it just builds it builds even small amounts build and so perse perseverance i think is really big absolutely yep great advice okay and i think we'll wrap up with this question from anissa what are some books that you are reading right now? 
<laughs> what am I not reading right now? I feel like I've got like 17 books going at once. Jennifer, you want to take that while I scroll? Yeah, yeah. Way? While you think of all yeah. of the ones. Well, I was lucky enough to get to read an early copy of Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr. And oh, I, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. It's so amazing. And that was good. It's going to come out September 28th, maybe, or something. Oh, and I'm, I'm like, yeah. Um, I, love him. I, 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 um, I've been reading this book because I'm about to have an event with Gwen Strauss. It's called The Nine. It's about nine women who banded together and escaped a labor camp in World War II. So relatedly oh, wow. to okay. our subject matter. Um, there's a book I really want to read <laughs> called um, One Kind Favor. It's just out or just about to get out by um, by a writer I love named Kevin McElvoy, One Kind okay. Favor. So I'll name those. Oh, that sounds great. Um, gosh, um, uh, I, I guess, for, well, I'm reading a bunch for blurbs. Um, and so the one I'm currently reading for a blurb is, um, is Lisa Barr's uh, upcoming book, which is called Woman on Fire, um, which is really good so far. Um, I just read the Clover Clover Girls by Viola, sorry, Viola mm -hmm. Shipman, um, which is actually the pen name of a writer named Wade Rouse. Um, and I'm actually doing an event with him in less than an hour. <laughs> so I had to finish the Clover Girls so I could ask him some questions. I, that was a fantastic book. It's um, it's about summer camp in the 1980s. And then these people reunite um, like in the present day. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, it brought back like all those 80s vibes. You know, it's like so many, everything I remember from the 80s. I'm like, yes, I did that. I did that. I'm like, yeah um so that was really good and um Pam Jenoff's The Woman with the Blue Star I just read yeah. recently too and I, I I really liked that a lot too yeah great well thank you both so much this has been a really wonderful conversation thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us tonight um as a reminder I've put links in the chat to purchase the Book of Lost Names and the Yellow Bird Sings so you can follow those links to purchase those from Harvard Bookstore as well as Kristen and Jennifer's other books. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for, for the talk. And um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, have a good night and keep reading. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs>